In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord, today we thank you for the gift of each and every life in this room, each and every life in this parish, each and every life in this city and state and country and world. As we pray and reflect and learn about the meaning of life, and most importantly, how to defend it. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon each one of us, that you would make each of us and our entire community defenders of life, so that we can go out to the entire world and proclaim your good news that life is precious, life is a gift, and life is worth defending. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Beating a dead horse. My son, you know, said this last night to friends. Oh, I know he's going to show this slide. 3 Peter 1.15. And I was like, no, there's not three Peters. There's one, there's one Peter 3.15. He was like, well, I was close. So, but it's true. First Pope, uh, always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who demands a reason and accounting for your hope. So that's what we're doing with these purpose sessions. It's not to scientifically prove the Catholic faith. It is to, uh, to understand how best to defend certain aspects of our Catholic faith. Last week we talked about God first. This whole fall, this whole spring rather, we're talking about morals, uh, the Catholic foundations for morals. Last week we talked about God first and how God first, those first three commandments, are essential to any moral construct for our society and especially for us as Catholic Christians. So this week, we're getting into more nitty-gritty stuff. We're talking about life, the first most sacred gift. My disclaimer at the beginning of this is, uh, well, I have a few probably. Uh, All of this is okay for kids, okay? I'm going to try to make the language okay for kids. Uh, My kid's going to be in here the whole time, and so it's, you know, it's okay for kids. But we're obviously going to be discussing abortion, okay? Um, So I'm not going to shy away from the realities of, of abortion. Uh, I'm not going to get into any details or anything, but that's, you know, it's the reality of the world we're living in, and it's, our, it's, our, it's my kid's generation that's being impacted. It's y'all kid's generation, those of you who have kids, that's being impacted by this grave evil. And so I don't think it's, uh, it doesn't do him or any of his friends any good to shy away from the gravity of the situation and the reality of the situation. Um, So that's number one. Number two, uh, today is not about politics for me, okay? Obviously, these kinds of topics bear on political decisions, on voting decisions, who are you voting for, who are you supporting. That is not the purpose of today's session, to talk about politics or to talk about voting habits or who should vote for whom or anything like that. Um, So if it comes across that way, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize if it does come across that way because some of this stuff does impact the political. But my focus here is not going to be on the political, okay? Um, and I'm going to try to leave room at the end for questions and answers for Q&A. Well, I don't know how many A's we'll have, like answers, but, <laughs> but uh, I'll try to leave room at the end for questions because uh, I know some of these are really thorny, difficult uh, topics. I'd ask that you keep your questions respectful and keeping in mind the different age ranges in the group today. Um, And I would not pretend to have every single potential answer that that is out there because it's easy in a lot of ways to talk about what we talked about the first three weeks, okay? The notion of natural law, natural law theory, the notion of putting God first, the first three commandments. But when we're getting into the next three weeks of what we're talking about, This week, life. Next week, marriage and family. The week after that, social justice and solidarity issues. When we're getting into those things, it gets into a lot more nitty-gritty, rubber rubber meets the road type of stuff. And uh, so, so some of these things can be more difficult to talk about, uh, both for me in a group setting, but also just you know with one another. So. 
I really prayed and thought hard about what topics to cover this spring, and I talked it over with Monsignor Malone about what to cover and what not to cover, and uh, you know, we just decided, and I just decided, there's no sense in doing a series like this where we're this first year talking about faith and morals, of covering a whole thing on morals in the spring and not dealing with some of the more difficult topics. You know, we can't just ignore elephants in the room. Um, my uh, goal today and over the next three weeks of these more difficult topics is not to try to even necessarily convince everybody in this room on every single front here, okay? My goal is, I'm, I'm assuming I'm playing to a relatively friendly crowd, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not down at the state legislature just debating in open public with, you know, all sorts of random people, so I'm assuming even if there's some disagreement, it's disagreement in good faith and it's a relatively friendly crowd, but my goal is not to convince anybody here or anybody in our parish. My goal is to, is to give uh, kernels of arguments that you all can then feel comfortable going and taking to your friends and family and neighbors and co-workers so that when you're faced with these kinds of questions, there's some sort of reasonable response that you have at the ready, okay? So that's where I'm coming from. First of all, life as a gift. You hear me talk constantly about oftentimes our disagreements are not actually with certain particular issues, but with underlying premises that are the foundations of those issues, right? So you can't necessarily start talking about LGBT issues, for example, directly talking about those issues. Sometimes you have to talk about well, what do we mean by natural law? What do we think, how do we think that uh, we've been created by God? What does that mean? What does freedom really mean? That's why we spent an entire session just on what is the nature of true freedom. If you don't understand what freedom is for us as Christians, then a lot of this stuff, uh, you, you know, you're just talking over and beyond and, and past one another. Uh, you're not actually going to get to the crux of the, of the issue. And the same thing is true with life. Life is a gift. Life is a complete and total gift. My life, the life of my wife, the life of my two kids, um, it, it is a complete and total gift that none of us deserved. When we approach life as a gift, a lot of this other moral argumentation uh, can eas more easily fall in place. If we view life as an entitlement, that's a problem. If, we view, if, if you're talking with someone who views life as an entitlement, they view children as something that they deserve. They are owed children because they've always wanted kids. And so because they've always wanted kids, they're entitled to have a kid, no matter what way, shape, or form that comes about. If children are an entitlement, something that you're owed, as opposed to a pure and total gift, then that's a problem. If life is random chance, if our life is just random confluence of events, uh, and, and there's no providential guidance to it by God, and it's not a gift, it's just random chance, if life is that random, then it's not worth a whole lot. And so, a lot of these other issues, if someone is taking the, the approach of random chance towards life, uh, then things like euthanasia uh, are not that big of a deal to them. Because the intrinsic value of life is not the same as if we approach life as a gift. Life as a gift. Life as an intrinsic good. Something intrinsic that intrinsically good. Some things... And this is going to be key for our next three weeks as well, okay? Some things are just intrinsically good. Other things are intrinsically evil. When something is intrinsically evil, that means it's evil no matter what the person's intention is, no matter what other factors are that are surrounding it. That decision, that choice, that action, the action itself is an evil act. There are some things that are just intrinsically evil, meaning they are evil in and of themselves. There's no explaining it away. It's just an evil choice. That's just the reality of it. The same thing with good. There are some things that are, that are intrinsically good. That means they have value, they have goodness in and of themselves. No matter 
what, other, what else may be, uh, society may view as wrong with it, that thing is in and of itself good. Life is one of those things. No matter how uh, disabled a person might be, no matter how conscious or not someone might be, no matter how young or old or in utero someone might be, that human life has intrinsic value, is intrinsically good, and none of these other external factors can take away from it. Intrinsic evil versus prudential judgment. This is also key for our next three weeks. There are certain decisions, certain issues, certain, uh, certain actions that are intrinsically evil, no matter what else is involved. And there are other uh, issues, other decisions, that are a matter of, as we in Catholic uh, tradition would call it, it's a matter of prudential judgment. Okay? So, and we'll get to some of these later, but for, for example, poverty. Okay? We can all agree poverty is a bad thing, okay? Some, and not poverty in and of itself, but let's say someone dying of hunger, okay? Someone literally dying of starvation. That's, that's not a good thing, right? That's a bad thing. But there can be prudential disagreements between Catholics, between Christians, so on and so forth, as to how do we best address the issue of children dying of starvation in Africa. What's the best way to address that? That can, that, there can be disagreement in some, in some form or fashion because that's a matter of what's called prudential judgment. You use your prudence, you decide, yes, we agree racism is bad. Yes, we agree uh, uh, you know, unlawful use of force is bad. But how do we address those issues? There can be actual reasonable room for disagreement on some of those issues. On other issues that involve intrinsic evil, there is no room for disagreement. On things that involve intrinsic evil, there is simply no room for disagreement among Catholic Christians. That doesn't mean there aren't Catholics who disagree. I mean, I'm not so naive as to think that everybody agrees. We all know that's not the case. But Catholic teaching is there's no room for disagreement because these th certain things are intrinsically evil. Principle of double effect. This is a, you know, a little philosophical here. But this is critical for combating and addressing a lot of arguments about abortion specifically, okay? And a lot of life issues generally. The principle of double effect says that you can do a good action, you can perform a good action, even if, even if you can foresee that there's a bad effect that will result from this action, okay? You can do that only if there are four conditions that are met. First, the act itself must be good. The act that you're trying to carry out is a good act. You can't do bad things to achieve good results, right? The means never justify the ends. The act itself must be good. You must only intend the good act. You must only intend the good act. Not whatever you foresee, but don't necessarily intend being the bad effect. And I'll give an example of this later on when we're talking about abortion. So, you know, but I'm laying the groundwork here, okay? So that's number two. Your intention can't be that I'm intending the bad effect. You're intending the good act, knowing that the bad effect is going to result, but you don't want the bad effect to result, but you're aware of the fact that that's going to, be a that's going to happen. The good effect can't arise from the bad effect. Otherwise, you'd be doing evil to, to affect a good. All right. The unintended but foreseen bad effect, the bad thing, can't be disproportionate to the good thing. Okay? The bad thing can't be disproportionate to the good thing. All right? It's called the principle of double effect. It is very close, it is very close to the incorrect moral, found, uh, moral theory called proportionalism or consequentialism. So if you want to do more reading on this, just be, be careful when you're, when you're examining situations that you're not falling into the trap of proportionalism, which basically says that the end justifies the means. That as long as the good of a situation outweighs the bad, then it's okay to do bad. That's not what principle of double effect is saying. Okay? It's, it's, they're close, and in some ways they overlap, and they often get confused. But the principle of double effect 
is a legitimate Catholic way of analyzing moral issues. Abortion, specifically. I want to go through kind of a list of common objections to the Catholic position on abortion. First, you can't impo impose your morality on others. You can't, you can't impose your morality on me. All right? We covered that, if you weren't here uh, two or three weeks ago, we covered that in either the first week or the second week of this, of this series, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse and go over all that again. But the reality is, people impose their morality on others all the time. I mean, that, you know, in, in politics, in normal everyday life, you know, the politicians that I hear say, you can't impose your morality on others, and then they go off preaching about how, it's, how certain budget decisions or whatever are morally reprehensible. It's kind of like, well, I mean, you, you know, you can't pick and choose what issues you're imposing morality on. Everybody imposes their morality in one way, shape, or form. But that's just the reality of it. So to, when someone says to you, you can't impose your morality on me, or a politician should not impose their morality on others, call them on it. Because that same politician or that same person or that person that you're speaking with almost certainly does impose their morality on somebody else. Also, the very statement, you can't impose your morality on me, is a moral statement. That's a moral command. That you, so, you're, so you're imposing on me the fact that I can't impose my morality on you, but you've imposed that on me. So it's, it's a self-defeating argument. Fetuses aren't real human beings. They're not real humans. They're not real human beings. Um, I find, and I think most effective Catholic apologists find, that the better approach to some of these difficult objections is not to address them head-on with an argument, but is to ask questions. Ask questions in a charitable manner. Because when you start asking questions, and I'll show a video of this here in just a little bit, when you start asking questions, the other, it helps the other person see the weaknesses of their position. So how do you define what a real human being is? And that's what I would ask. I would ask the other person, if, fetus, if a fetus is not a real human being, how do you define what a real human being is? We're going to get to that in just a second as well. Similar type argument. Fetuses are only potential human beings. They have the potential for being a human being, but, uh, but they're not a real human being yet. So the questions would be, how do you define potential human being? And I would ask, you know, how do you define that? When, wh what do you mean by potential human being? When does someone go from being a potential human to fully human? When does that happen? I mean, name for me when that happens. If it doesn't happen at the moment of conception, you tell me, when does the person become fully human? Because any, the reality then becomes any attempt to define human being, the moment of human beingness, becomes arbitrary. It becomes, it becomes arbitrary. So it leads to ridiculous conclusions like this. If you don't believe that human beingness begins at conception, which is, by the way, a scientific fact, okay? Another, you know, another frustration that I have is, um, and politicians on both sides do this, on both sides do this. On the left, will say, well, I believe personally that abortion is wrong, but I don't want to impose that on others. I believe personally that life begins at conception, but that's a matter of my faith. That's a matter of my faith, and I don't want to impose my faith on others. And on the right, politicians will say, when asked about uh, abortion, uh, well, yeah, I'm very pro-life uh, because uh, that's a matter of my faith, and my faith, that's, I believe it because the Bible says so, or my Catholic faith says so, and my faith is the most important thing to me in the world, and it trumps everything else, and so that, that's what I'm going to stick with. Both of those arguments annoy the junk out of me, okay? Because it's not a matter of faith whether or not life begins at conception. I would so much rather a politician just say, the science shows that at the moment of conception, everything is all the genetic material, everything's there for that, per, for that human being to grow and flourish into being, a, because it is a human being. Now it's a super teeny tiny small human being that hasn't developed yet, but I'm a 38-year-old human being that has not developed yet into a 70-year-old human being. So, but, but the science says, I mean, that's just, I would much rather 
we call a spade a spade and stop falling back on faith arguments so easily and so quickly, and instead start with natural law and science-based arguments that then slip into our faith-based arguments. But to say, well, my faith says that life begins at conceptions, and my faith's the most important thing to me, you're going to lose all sorts of people at that moment of argument, of arguing about this issue, because they're going to say, well, that's your faith, that's not my faith, so don't impose it on me. But if we can stick to the science, we stick to natural law, we have a, we have a, law, uh, we have a shorter path to go to at least bridging the divide. You know, I'm not no, so naive as to think that someone who watches this video online is going to all of a sudden convert to being pro-life, but we can at least start having a conversation about the issue that, that means something. So when is someone fully human? Is it at conception? I don't know. Is it at heartbeat? I don't know, maybe. I don't know. Viability? Is it when the baby's viable? Is it at birth? Is it when they start to talk? You know? I mean, they, they're born, but they're not exactly conversant. You know, they, they can't really communicate well. And, uh, and so they're not really sentient beings. So until they can talk, then, uh, then they're not really fully human. They're, and believe it or not, there's a movement in, of pro-choice ac in academia that holds this very position. Okay? Uh, I mean, very smart people at places like Princeton hold this position, that for the first year or two of life, it would actually be morally justifiable to end that life because they're not fully communicative with those around them. Is it at, when they're potty trained? You know, a lot of parents would say, yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's when life really begins, <laughs> at least for me, right? I mean, that is, that's a deal breaker, so that's huge. Is it when the kid graduates, you know, from high school or college? Thank God they're out of the house. That's, you know, is that when life begins? Is it when they get a job and they've actually moved out of the... Yes, yes. <laughs> when they get a job and they're supporting themselves and so on and so forth? I had a professor once who drew out a, a graph like this, and he kept going on and on and on. He goes, my life began at tenure. So he wrote tenure up at, you know, the very end of it. That's when I got tenure. That's when my life began. But the point is... You know, ask someone, if they don't believe that life begins at conception, that, the, that at this moment there is a human being, a human life with intrinsic value, then when is it? When does that happen? And you're not ever going to be able to get a good, clear answer because any other answer, any other answer leads to uh, absurd results. The most honest answer that I've gotten, the most honest answer is, well, yeah, you may be right here, but I, re but I really don't know. You know, I, you, we really don't know. The science really doesn't know. And I'm just not convinced, and I really don't know. Uh, you know, I don't agree with that answer, but it's at least more honest than saying, yeah, human life begins at birth. Because that's just, that's just, it just can't be. It just leads to absurd results. When you're faced with someone who says, yeah, I really just don't know, uh, ask them this. Okay, okay, you say you don't know for sure in this area, when does life begin? If, if you're a parent and you've got a kid who's playing out in the, in, running out into the street, playing out in the streets, okay, would you say to the kid, uh, you know, I don't know for sure whether or not a car's going to come down this street, uh, but, uh, you know, just take your chances, or you got a kid, this doesn't, analogy doesn't really apply well down here because we're in the south, but up north it happens all the time. Your kid runs out onto a frozen pond, and you're not sure whether or not that frozen pond is going to bear their weight. Would you say to the kid, you know, maybe, maybe the kid, will, my son will be okay, maybe not, I'll take my chance. If you don't know for sure, at the very least, if you don't know for sure whether or not humanity begins in this area, wouldn't you always, I mean, our natural inclination would be to err on the side of caution. So wouldn't you want to err on the side of assuming that life begins here? Wouldn't you want to? It's a little cartoon that gets floated around sometimes. Bishop says, when does life begin? At the moment of conception. Judge, at birth. A teenager dude, when you get your driver's license. <laughs> so, and there's all sorts of versions about this, but, but the point is the same. Okay? The point is the same. When does life begin? 
you know, I hate the answer. Well, I believe at conception the potential for human life began. The potential is there. for life. Well, what does that mean? I mean, my one-year-old, I don't have a one-year-old anymore, but my one-year-old has a potential to, you know, go to kindergarten or a potential to do all sorts of things. I have the potential to live until I'm 40. I mean, I have the potential, all of us have potential, but our intrinsic value, our intrinsic value is not based on our potential. Our intrinsic value is based on the fact that life is a gift. Other common arguments, well, we just talked about this one, uh, life beginning at the moment of conception. Again, it's not a matter of faith or my belief, it's a matter of science. Now, it is a matter of faith and belief. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, our faith plays an impact on what is the nature of that intrinsic value and that God, you know, gave us a soul and, you know, body and soul and all that. I'm not saying that faith has no bearing. But if your starting point in these arguments is, well, my faith says such and such to me, you're going to, a lot of people are just going to start shutting you out and tuning you out. I have a right to do with my body what I want. I have a right to do with my body what I want. Two things. Number one, abusing your body is in and of itself an offense against the gift of life. Abusing your body, if life is a gift, if my body is something I'm entitled to, I'm entitled to this thing, then you're going to lose the argument. But if you view the the body as a gift, that my life is a gift, then abusing your body in and of itself is an offense against that gift. And so none of us, I will never be pregnant. You know, barring some really weird situation, I will never physically be pregnant, okay? But I can still abuse my body. All right? I don't have a right to do whatever I want with my body because it's not ultimately my body. My whole, my whole being is a gift. Also, we don't have a right to abuse our bodies when it impacts, when it negatively impacts another human being. And on this issue, you, you get to the crux of, is the fetus a human being? And if we can't agree on when does life begin, when does someone become human, then this argument, we're just going to keep spinning in circles. Because the issue really is, what is inside the woman? Is it another human being, or is it not? If it is another human being, then the logical consequences of that are basically what the Catholic position on abortion is. What about worst case scenarios? You know, this is the, this is the issue that gets thrown out most often. In abortion uh, type debates is worst case scenarios, a couple of which I'm not going to go into given the young, uh, young folks in the crowd, mostly because I don't want the vocabulary questions when I go home today. Um, but we all know what those are, okay? And so with those in mind, the reality is, uh, you know, to put it simply, two wrongs don't make a right, and uh, it's never, it's never a fetus's fault that he or she exists. It's never the unborn child's fault that he or she exists. Now, do those issues need to be treated with charity and care? And, resp- and are those issues very different from, a, care- from, a, from a, a charity standpoint than someone who just, you know, views their child as totally, you know, a nuisance to them and, and, and they have plenty of, you know, I mean, uh, ver- I recognize that those are very different situations from a pastoral standpoint in terms of how you handle them. But we're not talking about being pastoral, which is, should be a given for all of us, being pastoral and charitable with people. We're talking about whether or not that life has intrinsic value. And if the life has intrinsic value, intrinsic, then no matter what external factors are out there, it doesn't impact the a- intrinsic value of that life. Back in late 2017, there was this Twitter war that erupted. Are any of y'all on Twitter? Anybody on Twitter? So I don't do a lot of tweeting myself, but, I, but I'm on Twitter because I follow people and I get my news from there, and so it's actually very handy in that regard. But a huge Twitter fight broke out because there's this guy, uh, a comedian slash journalist guy, and, uh, and he wrote this 20-tweet-long thing. And the lead-in was, 
Uh, whenever abortion comes up, I have a question I've been asking for 10 years now uh, of the pro-life crowd. I, miss the, I mistyped that out. Of the pro-life crowd. Life begins at conception. Oh, there it is. Life begins at conception. In 10 years, this is what he says, no one has ever answered it honestly. Ever. He put ever in all caps to emphasize that no one has ever. And I'm glad he did that because otherwise I would have lost his point. So no one's ever answered this honestly. Here's the scenario. Imagine you're in a burning building. You can either save your five-year-old son. Your five-year-old son's over here, okay? And then over here, across this other doorway, is a box of a thousand frozen embryos. Which one would you choose? And the smoke is billowing up, okay? And you know that you can only save one. You can either save your son, or you can save this thousand frozen embryos. And he went on and on and on and and then he concluded by saying, everybody would choose the, your own five-year-old kid, right? Everyone would do that. And so that proves, that proves that, uh, that the pro-life crowd is hypocritical because we wouldn't save the 1,000 embryos. And so therefore, we know intuitively that those 1,000 embryos are less valuable than my five-year-old son. And so then he said, this is part of the, his uh, t- tweet string. They will never answer honestly because they all instinctively understand the right answer is A, choosing the five-year-old son. Human child is worth more than a thousand embryos or 10,000 or a million because they are not the same, not morally, not ethically, not biologically. Okay? So this is the, this thing went viral, right? This thing went viral such that Salon, a magazine, picked it up. Other media outlets uh, picked it up. This is the Salon headline. Love it, right? The Twitter thought experiment that exposes pro-life hypocrisy. We were exposed. So the comedian and sci-fi writer Patrick Tomlinson. So I always hinge my best moral arguments on comedians and sci-fi writers, first of all. Okay? So if it's that carries a lot of weight with me, all right? And on the danger the dangerous question, danger that abortion foes refuse to answer. Dun dun dun. I put that in there myself. The dun, the dun, dun, dun. That wasn't from Salon. That wasn't from. That was dun, dun. I was just dun, dun, dun. Oh, we're all hypocrites, and what it is we are. And so, you know, I would like to think uh, that you'd like to think that a lot of people are rational people, but you know, it's shocking. <laughs> I mean, I on my Facebook feed, I had, you know, people that I thought were just normal people who would who reposted this, this uh, Twitter exchange as you know, proof that all of their pro, pro-life friends were idiots and hypocrites and whatnot. And, but then when you go back to them with the responses, they don't want to debate. When you go back to them with the counter-arguments, they don't want to debate. They, they don't want to actually engage on the issues, but they're happy to throw out these kind of red herring situations. First of all, we talked about two weeks ago the issue, maybe three weeks ago, these, uh, these different uh, bases for morality, okay? And a couple of them were emotivism and voluntarism. Emotivism, basing moral decisions based on emotion, what you feel, what compels you, right? Voluntarism, whatever you will, whatever you will. This kind of a scenario is founded on emotivism, all right? That's what it's founded on. We don't make moral decisions. If my five-year-old girl is is swimming in a, is floating down a river, okay? And there's some other five-year-old girl whom I don't really know very well who's floating down the river too and they're going towards a waterfall and they're both going to fall off. And I know I can only get to one. I can only save one. You know, which one would you choose? I mean, all of, everybody hears that one growing up, right? And so, I mean, it's my five-year-old. I mean, instinctively, in the moment... Am I going to pick my five-year-old girl? Yeah, that's my five-year-old girl. I'm going to save whom I can save, yes, but I'm going to save my kid. That doesn't mean principle of double effect. That doesn't mean I'm intending the death of this other five-year-old girl. What's killing this other five-year-old girl is this random confluence of chance that she's in a river floating down, probably about to go over a, a, a waterfall. It's a completely... It's a, it's a completely junky analogy to the abortion issue. Same thing with the burning building issue. 
If I save my five-year-old son and don't save the 1,000 embryos, that doesn't mean that I think the 1,000 embryos don't have intrinsic value. I'm making a morally instinctive decision to save my kid. And it, by the way, it's not me who's killing the 1,000 frozen embryos. It's the fire in the building, all right? I'm not going to save my kid and then taking the 1,000 embryos and dumping them into the fire. That's not what's happening, all right? So principle of double effect comes into play. We don't make, the, there's a reason why we don't make these moral decisions based on these crazy hypotheticals that stir up our emotion because our moral decision making should not be based primarily on emotion. It should be based on all the things we've talked about these last three weeks. Emotionally valuing your own child doesn't equal uh, that, that these embryos don't have intrinsic values. What if I had my five-year-old kid here, and instead of the thousand frozen embryos, I had uh, uh, an 80-year-old woman? No offense to any women in here who are 80, okay? Uh, or, or any other woman, or women in general, or at all. It's not anti-woman, okay? Probably should have clarified that on the front end. Sweetie, I will owe you later. I'm sorry. I, 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 Okay, five-year-old, let's, let's, let's say it's a man, okay? We're switched to a man, okay? <laughs> Walked into that one. But if I save my five-year-old kid, that's not saying that I think the 80-year-old man or 80-year-old woman or the 30-year-old man, it's not saying that I think that that person doesn't have intrinsic value. That's not what, it, that's not what it's saying. But that's what this Twitter war was all about, Okay? And it was demonstrating the pro-lifers' hypocrisy. Well, when you can't even agree on these notions of emotivism and positivism, this notion of intrinsic value and what intrinsic value means, because people went back to this guy with, okay, here's my argument. Here's, here's the counter-argument. This is what the, the, how you resolve this issue. And he just erupted. You know, well, this is a totally dishonest way of reasoning. And, you know, you just you kept throwing people under the bus. Well, I mean, that, that betrays real dishonesty on that pro-choice type of argumentation because they don't want to interact with what the realities of logic dictate. And if you're interacting with someone to whom logic does not apply, then you're not going to convince them at least not immediately. And I know this will shock many of you. It's going to be a huge shock. But convincing someone over Facebook via logical argumentation doesn't happen that often, all right? So, you know, oftentimes it's better to say, hey, let's go grab a drink. You know, why don't you come over to my house for dinner? Or, but, you know, shockingly, people's Facebook, you know, stuff does not lead them often to a con conversion of life, sadly. Crazy hypotheticals, you know, crazy hypotheticals are, I could come up with any sorts of crazy hypotheticals, but we don't make moral decisions on what is morally right and wrong based on crazy hypotheticals. This is a video, uh, Catholic Answers video, that uh, Trent Horn, who's a Catholic apologist, was answering questions. It's relatively short, and I'm playing it not so much because of uh, the content, although the, although the content's helpful. Um, but I'm playing it because I think that he gives a good demonstration of tone, okay? Of how do you interact with someone who's pro-choice in terms of tone, and in terms of, notice how he asks her questions. He tries to flesh out the issue, not by saying, well, the catechism says this in such and such a paragraph, so you better buy into it. He, he draws her in uh, by asking questions, which I think is, on this issue specifically, probably, in my opinion, the most helpful way of doing Catholic apologetics. So, Caitlin in St. Louis, Missouri, why are you pro-choice? Can everybody hear this okay? Not so much. So, Caitlin from Missouri calls in, and she's saying, I'm pro-choice, and I want to talk about why I'm pro-choice. Hello? Hi, Caitlin. Are you there? Yeah. Too loud? Welcome. Thanks for calling. Why are you pro-choice? Well, I guess I'm pro-choice. I just think that, you know, women should have the choice. Um, 
You'll be able to hear him better than her, obviously. She's calling in through a phone. But she's basically calling in saying, I'm pro-choice. And I think also that even if we were to make abortion illegal, people are still going to get them. And I just want it to be safe for the women. Okay, well, that part's true. Uh, abortions are still obtained, even if it's illegal, but you haven't really asked, answered why I, you're well, pro-choice. I, I think I've, I've taken it from around? that. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, are you worried that if you're pro-choice because if we make abortion illegal, it becomes more dangerous for the woman choosing it? Yes, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm worried about. Okay. All righty. Well, here's my position on that. I agree with you. I agree that abortion should be safe. In fact, I would be okay with abortion totally fine with it if it were as safe for the child as it is for the mother. Do you see what I mean by that? I do. What do I mean by that? I think you mean, because it might be safe for the woman, but I mean that the child's the one that's not being able to live any longer, so they don't get the choice. That, that's, that's inherently the problem. You're right. If abortion didn't involve another human being's life, then it'd be obvious we should keep it legal so it's safer. So for example, if, it, if tonsillectomies, the removal of the tonsils, becomes more dangerous if it's illegal, well, we should just make that procedure legal. It's a good, you know, if the tonsils are damaged in some way, go ahead and surgically remove them. But for me, there's no safe way to do an abortion because half the people involved always end up getting killed. I owe that one to my friend Jason in Arizona. It's a good observation. So I guess, Caitlin, I, uh, this was actually, when I was at the University of California in Berkeley, this objection was raised a lot during a debate I had. And this is my response to them. I said, should we keep it legal so it's safer for bigger people to end the lives of smaller people? I mean, what do you, I mean, what do you think? Oh, uh, gosh, no. Okay, well, when you put it that way, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a social worker, so mm -hmm. obviously I, I'm the one that fights for the people that don't have a voice, so it's just, it's hard to mm -hmm. make this decision. Well, I mean, what, what is it about abortion that makes it so hard? I don't know. I just I understand that the the fetus has a right, that the baby has a right. But mm -hmm. I mean, I think a woman should have a the right to choose too. You you see how those would conflict, wouldn't they? Yeah, I I understand that it's, it's so kind of hypocritical. Well, but here's the thing, I guess, Caitlin. When we when one person we're talking about their right to l have a life, and the other person we're talking about their right to live their life how they want to. Shouldn't we put the right for one person to even live at all to be at least a bit higher than the other person's right to kind of choose things? Oh, I don't know. Would you be willing to think that over, that it's plausible that one person's life, that should count more than what another person wants to choose to do with their life? Maybe. Well, I, I think that's something to, to think over when it comes to this issue, because that's the crux when we talk about abortion. And I would encourage you when you think about this issue to not think about the choice, because choice is a very abstract word. What abortion is, technically speaking, is it's the removal of a child from the womb before they can survive with the intent of ending their life. Now, I agree with you. People, men and women find themselves in difficult situations where they, they may choose this. But my question is this. Does being in a difficult life situation give us the right to hurt other people so we can make our situation better? I don't think it does. What do you think? No. Ugh, gosh, I don't think it does either. Okay. Uh, Caitlin, I'm hearing a very open-minded person. You're willing to say the word maybe here. Maybe is a powerful word, depending on the, the starting point of it. Um, I do think you'll enjoy the book that Trent wrote. It's called Persuasive Pro-Life. Yeah, why don't you, you can pick it up online very easily. In fact, I might try to see if we can get our call screener or someone to get you your address, your email address. I'd be happy to send it to you, and you can kind of look over and... Some of which, though, simply are not appropriate for kids in the room because they use graphic langu language and examples and imagery and stuff, and so I didn't want to do that. But, but I like his tone, okay? He's a little smart-alecky, but he just kind of can't help it. Um, <laughs> I, I can relate, <laughs> so, uh, but, he, but he asked questions, and then what I liked that he did at the end was when she showed some openness to being stumped, not to being stumped, but to being, uh, to being convinced that there could be another reasonable, plausible way of approaching this issue, he didn't say to her, 
uh, well, I'm right and you're wrong. He said, would you be willing to think about that? You know, would, you know if you're really struggling with it, would, is that something you'd at least be willing to think about and pray about some more? And, you know, maybe we could continue talking about it later. You're not going to convince people in a, you know, the 30-second elevator talk of, of it's not going to how it's going to happen. It's, about, it's, a, it's a matter, for the most part, of building relationship with people, finding an openness there, and encouraging them to stay open to thinking and praying about it some more. Running through a few other issues that are pro-life-based issues. In vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization, Catholic Church is against. Why? A number of different reasons. Again, is life a gift or is life an entitlement? It's separating the unitive from the procreative, which we will talk about more next week at Marriage and Family Stuff. Separates the unitive from the procreative. The means justifies the ends. The end of someone having a child is a good thing. That's not... The desire to have a child is a good thing. But if the means to achieving it is in and of itself bad, then, then IVF would be bad in the Catholic Church's mindset. Um, the ends for IVF also almost results in too many embryos. It's not just one embryo that's created, it's too many. Not too many, but it's more than just the one. And those embryos are almost always discarded or just frozen in perpetuity. Life is treated, again, as an entitlement and not as a gift. Euthanasia. Problems with euthanasia. Utilitarianism, pragmatism. Okay, we talked about these the first couple of weeks. If you weren't here for the first couple of weeks, go back and check out those videos what we talked about with pragmatism and utilitarianism. This views, at the opposite end of the spectrum, an old, usually an older person's life, although uh, sometimes a younger person who just has a you know, terrible uh, a, a brain injury or something like that, or some sort of a, a debilitating disease that's going to end up killing them anyway and they're suffering. But utilitarianism would say, that person isn't really going to be useful anymore to my family or to society or to us as a whole or even to themselves. And because they aren't as useful as I am or as you are, then it's okay to end their life. Emotivism and voluntarism. Are we making these decisions based on emotion? I mean, it's emotionally gripping when you see someone in their prime suffering from a terminal illness. It's emotionally gripping. I get why the argument in favor of euthanasia is emotionally gripping. But we don't make moral decisions based on emotivism or emotion. We base them on whether or not that life still has intrinsic value. Again, is life treated as an entitlement or just pure chance, or is it a gift from God that's up to God as to when to end? Capital punishment. Sticky one, I know. So uh, here we go. This is what the Catechism says about capital punishment. Okay? This is starting in, uh, it's in paragraph 226. Capital punishment doesn't, the church doesn't exclude the death penalty if... It's the only possible way of effectively defending human lives against the unjust aggressor. If non-lethal means are sufficient, then authority will limit itself to those means, as they're more in keeping with the concrete conditions of common good and more, this is the important part, more in conformity to the dignity of the human person. If there are non-lethal means available, the church teaches, then those means ought to be employed because they're more in keeping with someone's inherent, innate human dignity. Today, in fact, this is the catechism still, by rendering someone who's committed an offense incapable of doing harm without taking away from the possibility of redeeming himself, the cases in which execution is absolutely ne is a necessity are very rare, if not practically non-existent. That's a quote out of John Paul the Pope, Saint Pope John Paul II. Issues with capital punishment, okay? Capital punishment is not on the same plane as abortion. It's just not in terms of Catholic teaching. Okay? Abortion, intrinsically evil, there is never a circumstance in which abortion could ever be an okay thing. Capital punishment is not on that same plane. Is it a moral issue that the church ought to weigh in on? Yes, and she does all the time, as you all know. Okay? But it's not on the same level in terms of the hierarchy of truths of morality as abortion. 
or as euthanasia. Because prudentially, using prudential judgment, is there a circumstance in which capital punishment hypothetically could be justifiable, could be necessary? Yes. Under church teaching, yes, it's hypothetically possible. Okay? Is capital punishment intrinsically evil? Kind of. <laughs> it depends on how it's applied. It depends on how it's applied. As applied in this country, there's probably a good argument to say that in the vast majority of cases, it's an intrinsic evil because it doesn't match up with the rest of these requirements in the catechism. Is there a potential for development of doctrine? Yes, there is. For years, the Catholic Church did not necessarily preach vociferously against things like slavery. Okay? In today's day and age, the notion of slavery, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just out. Okay? Death penalty, I'm not to equate it to slavery, but death penalty, there's been a similar development of doctrine. But when you, get, when you hear those terms, development of doctrine, uh, those terms are, in my opinion, too loosely thrown around, okay? Because development of doctrine can mean we just develop into whatever we want, you know? Ten years from now, we could all be Buddhists because our, our doctrine is developed in ten years. And so now we're, that's not what development of doctrine means. Development of doctrine means there's still always continuity with previous church tradition, with the magisterial teachings of previous church tradition. So there's kind of two different... Uh, two different poles arguing right now on this issue, okay, from, from within the Catholic Church. There's this book put out by Ignatius Press, by these uh, guys, Fesser and Bissett, called A Catholic Defense of Catholic Punishment. And I have it, I've read it, it's good, okay? Um, and it's a good book. I don't agree with some significant parts of this book, just from an academic intellectual argument perspective. But it's not a childish, flippant book either. On the flip side, on the other poll, is a guy named Christian Brueger. If you Google him and Google his two essays in the public discourse, you're going to see these two essays on capital punishment, on why he argues that capital punishment is not acceptable from a Catholic position. I always recommend Brueger uh, for a number of different reasons. Number one, I know him personally. He was one of my theology professors, and so I, I know how he is. Number two, he is never going to be... Uh, accused of being on the radical left, you know, because he is, you just Google into him, he is one of the staunchest defenders on the areas of pro-life, on the areas of artificial conception, the areas of euthanasia, IVF, all of these issues. If anything, he's probably stauncher than these guys are on those issues, okay? He is, he is super with the church, and, you know, that's, I'm probably underselling him on this, all right? He's brilliant, he's a great scholar, and he wrote his dissertation on this issue on capital punishment in the Catholic tradition and whether or not there could, in theory, be a development of doctrine such that uh, the church could at some point declare capital punishment is intrinsically evil, okay? He argues it's possible. But he makes a distinction, this is critical, that there's a difference between punishment, death penalty as punishment, and death penalty as defense. Okay? And that's where, in terms of prudential judgment, it just gets really tricky. I have a good friend who works, uh, I get questions about this all the time. I have a good friend, Catholic friend, who works in the AG's office and worked on the death penalty stuff. And, and uh, he and I were talking the other day and brought up good points, all of which I've heard before, which are... You know, the Catholic, some in the Catholic Church, even our current Pope, have said that uh, solitary confinement is against the person's human dignity because it makes the person go crazy. It's against someone's human dignity to solitarily confine them. Uh, the flip side of that is some of these guys are so evil and messed up that you can't put them in general population. I mean, the only option of protecting other human beings is solitary confinement. So you're kind of in a catch-22. Someone who would very easily and very willingly kill a security guard, kill fellow inmates, but you can't put them in solitary, but you also, some would argue, can't use the death penalty. They're difficult issues. And I think that uh, that's why capital punishment is largely, uh, although it has foundational intrinsic value, dignity of human life, all of that's at the foundation, 
but there are also matters of prudential judgment in terms of how it's applied. Pope Benedict, years ago, before he became Pope, when he was uh, Joseph Ratzinger, you could Google around for this quote, but he, he gave a statement, uh, on, was talking about the death penalty and said that Catholics can disagree with their Pope in good faith on how the death penalty is applied uh, because it could be applied correctly, it could be applied wrongly. But they could not ever disagree with their Pope on the issue of abortion and euthanasia. Um, other life issues, really fast, and I know I've gone a lot longer than I anticipated, but it's an important topic and it's close to my heart. Seamless garment theory. Pros and cons. I don't love the seamless garment theory. I know it gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I don't love it because of this, because it's usually improperly applied and improperly understood as saying that, uh, this, that all life is good, so, uh, so we just need to do everything possible, and you are just as pro-life if you're against poverty but for abortion as those who are for abor against abortion but apparently for poverty or something like that. <laughs> Never understood that argument. But the seamless garment theory equates these other issues, oftentimes, with the issue of abortion. And in Catholic Church teaching, that's simply not the case. These issues are not on the same plane as abortion. Are these life issues? Health care, environment, racism, poverty, homelessness. Are these life-related issues? Yes. First to admit, life-related issues. Can people in good faith disagree about the best way to address these issues? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Um, and these issues we're going to get into, by the way, in two weeks on the social justice and solidarity stuff as well. Okay? I'm going to leave it there. I'll take like two minutes, five minutes, five minutes for any, if there are any questions that people want to ask in front of other people. If not, I'll linger and chat. Any questions? Nobody walked out on the room in me until the very end, but I'm going to take that as I went over time. Okay? <laughs> Question. Yeah, it's a similar. He asked about just war theory and capital punishment. It's the similar type. It's a similar type argument. Okay, is that with capital punishment, you're not actually intending. Your intention is not to kill the other person who's been convicted of the crime or whatever. The intention is self-defense is to protect society. It's the same argument of if someone breaks into my house and starts coming after my kids or whatever. My intention in attacking them and possibly killing them, my intention is not actually to kill the person. My intention is to protect my family. And if the only way I can do that is to kill the person, that's what's going to happen. And it's not that that's a good in and of itself. Killing another person is never a good in and of itself. But it can be justified because the good is protecting my family. And that's the principle, it goes back to the principle of double effect. Okay? Any other questions? I, I, it's not really a question. I'm trying to get into the video. Videos. Password for the videos is CTKLR. CTKLR, and CTK has to be in caps, all caps. So capital CTK and then lowercase LR. Yeah, and I tried to get into that indirectly without going into it with uh, the talks about uh, the, the worst case scenario type arguments, but yes, we would, okay? Because again, that life has intrinsic value. I tried that password this morning and it didn't work. I'm going to blame Monsignor Malone, <laughs> and he is in big trouble with right. me right now. I'll send him an email. Say but, uh, but I'll look into it. I'll, I'll look into it. I'll, I'll look into it. I'll get on it. Any other questions? Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, besides being the patroness of the Americas, is the patroness for all of the unborn. And so if I hadn't have rambled so long, we would have prayed to her a whole lot more today. Um, but let's go on ahead and, and pray a quick, I know some of you are going to, um, going to 1030 Mass, but we've got time to get in a decade of the Rosary. We'll do one decade praying to Our Lady of Guadalupe, the protectress of all of the unborn. And let's meditate especially on the, the, uh, the mystery of the Annunciation, where Gabriel came and said, you're pregnant, and she said, oh, great. Uh, because that's also the, 
That's also the mystery of the incarnation, okay, where the baby Jesus was, became incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And let's pray for the protection of all the unborn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, and now and ever shall be, the world without end. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry to keep you all late.